This is Killer Innovations, a show about ideas, creativity, and how you can innovate. Welcome to the Innovator's Garage, where you learn to create your next game-changing killer innovation. Welcome to this week's Innovations Podcast. I'm your host, Phil McKinney. As you can probably tell, I am not in the studio. I've been on the road for the last couple of weeks, and I had some interesting experiences. I wanted to grab them as they were occurring and share them with you. I've recently been traveling to New York, Washington, D.C. I'm now currently in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, about to walk on stage to give a uh, keynote this afternoon. But I wanted to take this time, pre-record this show, and get it to you. And what the realization has been over the last few weeks with the traveling here on the East Coast is, is that it's really uh, the, the, the essence of what I've, you know, I didn't say my eyes were opened. But it became a a starker reality to me in that there is this hero worship of Silicon Valley. When people find out that I spent a big chunk of my career there, you know, my role at Hewlett Packard, um, the work that I did there in the early 80s, everybody wants to know about Silicon Valley. Everybody's got um, some perception of it, whether it's the Silicon Valley TV show or about companies like Google, Facebook, Twitter, HP, Apple, Intel, um, etc. And there really is this hero worship to the point where people do not believe that there is much innovation really occurring, major significant innovation occurring outside of Silicon Valley. Now, in 1984, when I went to the Silicon Valley the first time, Um, I admit, I had that hero worship. I thought, wow, I had arrived, I landed in San Jose. In fact, my very first business trip, even though I was working out for a company in Chicago, they sent me to San Jose to meet with Visicorp. That'll age me. But it was through that experience uh, that really got me excited and with my desire to eventually end up in Silicon Valley. And I did that in 1984. And over the next... Four or five years I was there, I quickly, the, the bloom fell off the rose a little bit from the standpoint of what was important, whether it was drive the career or do what's right by the family. We made the conscious decision to leave Silicon Valley, go back to Chicago, and, and then eventually ended up in Washington, D.C. And then after my success at Telligent, HP approached me to come back to Silicon Valley to work for them and then to eventually take on the CTO role. And when I went back the second time, let me tell you, the the rose was, the, the bloom was clearly off the rose. There is some uniqueness in Silicon Valley, but this hero worship thing has just really gotten out of control. You know, we're all talking about unicorns and and how many of those unicorns are located in the valley versus others. Now, there's been companies that have bucked that trend and have gone off and done great things in other parts of the country. But what it has done in some cases is it's destroyed the, I don't know, the desire, the hope for innovators outside of Silicon Valley that they can achieve any form of even close to that kind of a success. You have to be in the valley or you don't. Um, matter. And what I have done, what it, what's happened to me over the last couple of weeks on this traveling is, is I've run across people, one, who are doing interesting things, and two, other people who kind of have fallen into this slump of believing that you have to be in Silicon Valley in order to have this form of innovation success. So today's show I want to talk specifically around innovation outside of Silicon Valley, which majority of you are not based in Silicon Valley. You're based in other parts of the country or you're in Silicon Valley and you're in this, you know, you have this perception that if you leave the valley, it's a desert. There's no opportunity for success. And I'm, today's show is really about proving to everybody and anybody that you can go and do great things outside of Silicon Valley. You do not have to be in the valley in order to achieve innovation success. So, again, as I said, I'm recording this live. I'm actually, interestingly enough, sitting on the floor inside of a closet, inside of a hotel room to try to get away from the normal noise trying to record this show. So, please bear with me, bear with the audio quality. 
you want to stick this through and really hopefully this helps you understand that there are people out there doing really great and interesting things now what are some of the characteristics of the valley that do make it unique well one is is the availability of risk capital people who are willing to invest dollars knowing full well that the odds are that 90 percent of those investments are going to fail if you're trying to do a startup and you're borrowing from friends and family my guess is your friends and family are not looking for that money to go away they're betting on you to be a success to give that return that's the difference between venture capital and angel investing or i shouldn't say more like friends and family investing now what is unique about the valley is just the aggregated sheer amount of billions and billions of dollars to put in these kinds of investments now i should say most but not all venture capitalists do have kind of a fundamental requirement that if they're based in silicon valley they want their startups based in silicon valley there are again some variations on that and there are also uh, venture capital firms that are not solely in the valley but are located throughout the country and in some cases around the world but one of those key objectives is really around this you know proximity to capital so is capital available everywhere in the country yes the challenge being is, is most people don't know who or how to ask how do you raise money if you've got this really great idea how do you find that local support within the small town rural community small cities etc now there are a lot of cities and organizations who are trying to create their own mini version of silicon valley and they've put together some funds um, there's also state programs you know i'm thinking of for instance the state of ohio along with the city of cincinnati has put together this fund in order to try to keep some of their up and coming um, startup companies to stay in the city and not get to a certain size and then go off and bolt to silicon valley my own personal experience is I spent five years living in Urbana-Champaign, Illinois, the hometown for University of Illinois. And if you think about all of the leading um, tech companies in Silicon Valley whose uh, founders came from the University of Illinois, the number is, is humongous. You know, the, probably the most prominent would be Mark Andreessen, who founded Netscape and now is one of the two founders of uh, Andreessen Horowitz Venture Capital, which is one of the largest, most prominent VC firms in Silicon Valley. My one claim to fame is, is when Mark and his, and his buddies were doing their student work at the University of Illinois, I was the president of a company called Terraplex. It was a supercomputer company. We were a spinoff from some technologies developed at U of I. And we actually ended up subleasing a little bit of office space to that team to work on their original business plan. I should have probably taken it in equity of Netscape, didn't, but uh, that so be it. But in the case of U of I, huge amount of students doing phenomenal work didn't feel they could stay in Illinois, much less Urbana-Champaign, and all bolted to Silicon Valley in the local community and the universities, lost the opportunity for economic development, economic growth, or as I said in the previous show, innovation-driven entrepreneurship. That evaporated when the skill base leaves and runs the Silicon Valley. But that's not always the case in all places. There are state programs, city programs to raise those funds. That becomes one of the key foundational issues for these companies that are trying to drive innovation outside of Silicon Valley. So, that being one. And then two is just proximity to talent. Can you recruit talent? Do you have talent in the local area? Again, University of Illinois, phenomenal talent. And a lot of cities and towns have phenomenal talent, uh, resources, people willing to you know, put their heart and soul into a new idea. Now, the other thing I want to dispel here is it isn't always about tech, right? You need money, you need resources, but the idea doesn't always have to be about tech. There's a lot of opportunity for innovation, everything from innovating uh, restaurant themes to um, innovating new retail strategies to innovating new ways to manufacture something. There's a wide range of innovation. So again, 
you can innovate outside of Silicon Valley, and we need to kind of break down this hero worship of Silicon Valley, that it's not something to worship, it's not something you're trying to replicate, you're trying to create innovations where you live, where you can have that kind of uh, local impact. So we're going to take a quick commercial break here. When we come back, we're going to pick up this conversation about innovations outside of Silicon Valley and give you some examples to give you some inspiration that if others can do it, you can do it also. So don't go anywhere. You're listening to Field Innovations on the BizDoc Radio Network. This is Killer Innovations, a show about ideas, creativity, and how you can innovate. Welcome to the Innovator's Garage, where you learn to create your next game-changing killer innovation. Welcome back to Killer Innovations. Before we hop back into the show, I want to do a quick shout out to one of our sponsors. This week's sponsor for this segment is Zoom. Zoom is a company that has developed a new and breakthrough approach to video collaboration um, audio, screen sharing, a tool that is absolutely critical if you're going to innovate. And it's one of those tools that allows you to innovate no matter where you're located. Look, I use Zoom with team members that are in Europe, that are in Asia, Australia, here in the U.S., and I do multiple Zoom calls each and every day. And the result is it allows us to be more productive and it allows us to innovate wherever we need to innovate anywhere in the world. Zoom has partnered with Kill Innovations and has made a free account available to you, the listener. So check it out. Hop on over to KillerInnovations.com slash Zoom and download and get your free account. So let's pick up our conversation on innovations outside of Silicon Valley. Now, I've over my travels, I've traveled pretty extensively over my entire career and have spent a fair amount of time over the U.S., and I actually have done a couple of previous shows about this, but I'm just going to give you some highlights, and I'll link to those uh, previous shows. One is, is my Katrina experience. So when the Hurricane Katrina came through to New Orleans, I got requested by the, uh, the U.S. government to help stand up some, a new wireless infrastructure um, in, uh, in New Orleans. And I was currently just moving into my CTO role um, at HP, and HP released me. And I ended up flying to Mississippi, driving to New Orleans, and sleeping in a sleeping bag in the flatbed truck of, uh, uh, of uh, in the bed of a flatbed truck because you couldn't sleep on the ground. So I was basically, you know, back to my Eagle Scout, Boy Scout days, camping out in New Orleans, putting up this, these infrastructures. What's amazing when you see these kinds of natural disasters, they're horrible. The impact they have on people's lives is, is just absolutely devastating. But you look at the, the innovation and the creativity that people pulled together in order to make it through the, the disaster, but also to prosper and enable uh, things to happen post those kinds of activities. The people pulling together really, really highly creative kinds of innovations just out of things that were around them in order to pull that um, together to... Do, you know, for housing or um, little pop-up stands, you know, you know, pseudo, you know, this is way back before food trucks were even really all that popular. You saw kind of people cooking food out of the back of, you know, min, you know minivans even to try to help and provide for people. And as a result, those people, <clears throat> and I was talking with some of the people who I worked with for the, the Katrina disaster as kind of a follow-up discussion. And a number of those people who pulled together and did those kinds of creative things, they found that as an inspiration to then go on and actually turn that into full-time businesses that have now been in existence literally decades later, um, but as, a, as, an, as that inspiration. Now, two more recent examples of, of kind of this realization that there's innovation outside of Silicon Valley. And one was last week I was... With, I landed in LaGuardia. I was giving a speech 
um, in uh, Midtown. I landed in LaGuardia. Cab driver picks me up. I just hopped in his cab. He's driving me to the um, New York City Hilton. And while we're talking, I come to find out that he's actually a medical doctor, full medical doctor with privileges from, um, from Egypt. He escaped from Egypt, came to the U.S., has been struggling to try to um, get his English skills to a point where he could pass the U.S. Um, medical exam and uh, also then look and find for his residency program. But as we were talking, he was sharing with me and some innovations that he's been working on with regards to new kinds of medical devices, particularly medical devices that could be used by non-medical professionals in developing countries where doctors are not readily available. And I was quite impressed. Uh, we ended up exchanging information. Hopefully he'll uh, follow up and, uh, and uh, see what can happen with uh, his ideas. But here's a guy who is you know, an immigrant from Egypt, in the United States, um, working as a cab driver to support his family, his wife, and two kids living in a one-bedroom apartment in the Queens, trying to make it happen, you know, here in the United States, trying to study at night in order to take his U.S. Uh, boards, in order for him to become a doctor here in the United States. And at the same time, he has this inspiration of helping others and developing innovations that could have a significant and positive impact on people's lives in developing countries. And then last night, I don't know what it is about cars with me, but I was in the, I was with a limo driver last night, picked me up in Boston, Boston, and drove me drove me up here to Portsmouth, New Hampshire. We had about a little over an hour's drive, and as we were talking, come to find out, this guy had 25 years experience again in the medical industry. Um, as a uh, medical device sales guy, and he had worked on a program with a couple of the med uh, medical supply companies to create new ways of selling and marketing medical devices. So he was not innovating the technology, but innovative in the approach of selling, etc. Now, you know, him and a bunch of buddies tried to do the startup thing. Um, it didn't work out. He ended up shutting it down. And uh, now he's on to this new thing of his, but he's working, you know, with a full-time job as a limo driver, you know, to, to pay the bills, keep his lights on, provide for his family, but he still has this, you know, desire. And, and this is a guy that's, you know, I'm going to guess probably 60, 61, 62, and still has that burning desire to do something, not you know, just check out and do you know the rocking chair on the front porch, um, and he is some of the things that you know don't want to share because it would kind of violate some some uh, at least some obligations I gave to him about keeping the information con confidential. But it's a pretty creative, innovative way to think about how do you lower the cost of medical devices and yet make them more prevalently available, easier to access, um, etc. So. You know, I hope he continues also. But here, just two random conversations in the back of either a taxi cab or a limo um, with my travels, uncovering two people. What's the odds of that? Two people, two cab rides, two uniquely driven innovations, two people highly driven to be successful, not giving it up, um, having that desire, and um, trying to innovate. But even the two of them believe that for them to be successful, they would have to go to Silicon Valley, and I try to dispel that um, perception with them and try to help them and coach them on what it is they could do to innovate right where they're at. So we're going to continue this conversation on innovations outside of Silicon Valley. So don't go anywhere. We're going to take this quick commercial break. You are listening to Kill Innovation on the BizTalk Radio Network.
This is Killer Innovations, a show about ideas, creativity, and how you can innovate. Welcome to the Innovator's Garage, where you learn to create your next game-changing killer innovation. Before we hop back into this segment, I want to give a quick shout out to our sponsor for this segment, which is HP. HP joined uh, as one of our sponsors a number of months ago, and we greatly appreciate that. Yes, I know. You're going to say, hold on, Phil. You used to be with HP. What's the deal? Now, I retired from HP in December of 2011. Um, and as you know, the show's been going on since 2005. Um, HP joined um, as a sponsor, which allows us to produce this content and keep it free of charge to you, the listeners. So we greatly appreciate their support. Go check out what HP is doing, particularly around security, protecting your information what they're building into their laptops and their desktops, all of their devices, including their printers, to protect your information to make sure that it does not end up in the hands of the bad guys. Check it out. You can hop on over to hp.com, or if you want to know specifically, for instance, the devices and technologies that I use and that what we use here in the studio, you can go over to killerinnovations.com slash HP and check it out. And in particularly, I am a huge fan of that new Mini Z2 workstation. So you want to check that out. Let's pick up our conversation with regards to innovations outside of Silicon Valley. And what I want to talk about today here is about innovations around the world. In the last segment, I talked a little bit about some of the things happening here in the U.S., my more recent experience, which is what triggered me to sit down and record this show right off the top of my head here to share with you kind of just this burning feeling that I have around this. But I also want to reflect back around what's happening across the world. Now, as I've said before, I've done extensive travel. Um, when I was CTO at HP, I was doing 350, 400,000 miles a year in the air. <clears throat> and in some years, more than half of that was outside the U.S. So I have, a, you know, got to see and engage with a lot of young startups and HP staff, et cetera, from around the world. Now, two in particular that I want to talk about is some innovation work in Africa. One is an area around what we call tiger lights. So in certain parts of rural villages in Africa, one of the risks to livestock, cattle, et cetera, are the local tigers, lions, et cetera. And so in some cases, farmers will stay their children to be along the fence line to try to scare away um, any predators that would come in and try to take away the livestock. And so one young kid, and I'm, I'm going to recall correctly, this kid's probably, I think, nine or ten years old, you know, hacked together some turn signal lights, car batteries, etc., and a little solenoid. And, uh, a blinker technology, you know, the blinkers out of a out of a car, and basically strung up a whole set of lights around the fence lines, and he strategically placed the lights so they would look like, um, you know, like the eyes, you know, when you reflect back on um, when you have a flashlight shine into a, an animal's eyes or whatever, and then he would turn this on at night and run it off of batteries, and these lights would blink completely around the fences. And what they found was, is because of the randomness that he applied, the tigers and lions stayed away. They couldn't quite see what it was. They felt it was maybe a human there that could you know, kill them or whatever, and they did not attack and uh, take uh, the livestock animals. And so here's this 10-year-old kid, and it turned out to be so popular that he actually was hiring his friends and they were making these and installing them in all kinds of uh, farmers, et cetera, in their local village until it finally got the attention of the government. And then ultimately it got the attention. And I, um, where I heard about this story was a couple of years ago um, at the TED conference in, uh, in Vancouver. And um, it therefore, you know, kind of got it, got, got it much more widely known, but, here was that practical innovation, the approach that was taken to literally take that, um, that idea or that problem space and solve it by just using parts and things that were made available. Now this ties into the second story, which is Lakeside Fish Farms. If you've been a longtime listener of this show, you know 
that um, a number of years ago, I worked with um, a, a guy that I knew in Silicon Valley who um, him and his wife moved to Rwanda full time. His wife is Rwandan and there's a whole story behind that. You can go back and search, just search for Rwanda over on Kill Innovations and you, will, uh, you can hear about some of the previous shows. But in this case, um, one of the times that I was in Rwanda, and usually we try to go for December if we can, in order to uh, spend as much time there. We were there, this is probably one of my earlier trips to, uh, to Rwanda. We were trying to solve a very particular problem, which is you know, oxygenation of water. So if you have big fish ponds, if you're into aquaculture, the fish consume oxygen. So you have to replenish that oxygen in some way. And so we have these big um, air pumps that pump oxygen into the water. But what you really want is you want to create bubbles. You want to create lots of bubbles in order to, uh, to inject, uh, get most of that oxygen to stay, in fact, as part of the, of the water and not just bubble the top and then be released into the air. So I was working on some different strategies and approaches to how we could test different innovations to bring oxygen to water. Great. So I'm working on all these drawings and Roger, the CEO, this friend of mine, looks over my shoulder and says, what are you working on? And I tell them what I'm trying to solve. And I've got a couple of what we call pond techs. These are the young men from the villages who actually oversee the fish in the ponds. And I'm working with them on some ideas. And Roger laughs and he goes, look, he says, there's no Home Depot, there's no Lowe's. There, what you're designing, you can't build here because we don't have access to that. They pick, he gets me out of my chair. We walk over to behind this, you know, think of it as kind of the trailer that comes, that would normally be attached to a tractor trailer, or six, you know, an 18-wheeler on the road or whatever. And he points behind it, and there's just this huge pile of junk. And he goes, guess what? You can build whatever you want to build out of that. That was the constraint. I had to use the resources that were available to me. And then when I got out of the way and I let the Pontex, who do this all the time, right? They're living in Africa. They have to deal with what it is they have immediate access to. They came up with some absolutely unbelievable innovations and approach it just took me to kind of open up my eyes and say, okay, yeah, I'm an innovation guy. Yes, I'm a tech guy. Yes, I can invent. But when it comes to doing these kinds of innovations that are immediately applicable but operate under some pretty significant constraints, the constraints being what resources do you have immediately available to you that you can then in turn leverage in order to um, make that into whatever the innovation is, you need, to, uh, you need to innovate. And so as a result of this, then the, uh, the innovations that they came up with were absolutely unbelievable, solved the problem, and was a big lesson learned for me around um, that innovation is alive and well, in many cases, when I pointed it out about these innovations, people don't think about it as innovation. They just think about it as a, hey, I had this problem, I need to do X, I've got these kinds of resources in my, in, you know, in the junk pile behind my house or in my barn, and I just put it together to solve it. But people don't recognize that those are truly inspiring innovations. And in some rare cases, some of the people have taken those innovations and turned them into products and services, like the Tiger Lights in the first story. You know, this young gentleman used whatever he had at hand to solve the problem because he didn't want to stay up all night guarding the livestock because he wanted to be awake in school the next day. So he was motivated to solve the problem. He solved it. It became popular. And then and he, in turn, with his buddies, turned it into a kind of a little pseudo service, they would go around and set it up for um, other farmers in, in the local area. And then eventually it got broader and broader attention. So even these practical innovations can turn into products and services that could have, you know, both benefit to the customers because they want that product and a benefit to the entrepreneur 
bringing income and creating jobs. So we're going to take another quick commercial break. When we come back, we're going to wrap up our conversation here around innovations outside of Silicon Valley. And I'm going to give you, you know, at least some of my thoughts about how to help, particularly those of you who are highly experienced innovators, how you can reach out and help those people who are doing innovations outside of Silicon Valley, help them make successful and help how to have impact on local economies. So don't go anywhere. We're going to be right back. You're listening to Pure Innovations on the Binstock Radio Network. This is Killer Innovations, a show about ideas, creativity, and how you can innovate. Welcome to the Innovator's Garage, where you learn to create your next game-changing killer innovation. Welcome back to Innovations. I'm your host, Phil McKinney. As we've been discussing today around this innovations outside Silicon Valley, I'm trying to dispel this perception that there's some magic there. Now, there are certain characteristics that are there that give some form of an advantage, as I said earlier in the show, around just the access to that capital. But one of the things I'm focusing on is how to help. How do I help? How can you help those that are innovating outside of Silicon Valley? Now, you may be someone outside of Silicon Valley trying to be that innovator, and you need that help. But you also may be that person who can help. You're an experienced innovator. You've had career success. How can you reach out and help? So one thing that I'm trying to do, and I would ask your help in doing this also, is by highlighting what others are doing to give them some exposure. If you come across somebody who is doing something really interesting, or you read an interesting story about an innovation that is um, you know, unique, different, but and not occurring inside of Silicon Valley, share it. Share it on social media. And feel free to tag me in it, because that way I'll see it. And if I see it, then I'll share it also. Right? It's how do we give exposure and raise the awareness of the great innovations that are occurring outside of Silicon Valley. And I found that just by giving, you know, them you know, a little bit of exposure, it has gone a long way. Some of the guests that we've been beneficial to find and have on the radio show have gone on to get a little bit of attention, raise a little bit of money, you know, get some traction going with their services or product ideas. And that's all great because that's really what it's all about. Innovation is about, is about ideas, making them real, becoming real, becoming something that people are willing to buy or pay you for. The other point of, of really raising this, this, highlighting this, is by showing others that they too can innovate. You know, look, if this kid can do tiger lights in Africa, or um, this guy that I rode, who gave me a ride last night up here to Portsmouth, New Hampshire, you know, developing and innovating a unique way to market and sell uh, a very specific, uh, vertically integrated kinds of uh, solutions. Um, then anybody can do it. And it's not just tied to tech. You can innovate literally anything. You can innovate the way you sew together clothes. You can innovate the way you cook. You can innovate the way you uh, organize kids' youth teams. You can innovate. There's thousands of ways to innovate. Innovation does not equal technology. There are other ways to innovate. And part of giving some people a little bit of exposure, helping them maybe find that 15 minutes of fame, is to show others that they too can innovate. And innovation takes on a wide range of forms. And by the other thing is by showing them how to do it. Part of the purpose of this show and the work that, that I do, whether it's my public speaking or taking, you know, doing coaching calls with young entrepreneurs or, uh, or even what we're doing with the innovators community is about helping innovators take that idea and turn it into something real. You know, it's about showing people how. You know, innovation is not some form of magic gift or skill. It's a skill that anybody can learn. 
anybody can practice and anybody can become proficient at. It's not something special. It's not something that only a few are blessed with. Everybody has this ability. We just need to convince everybody that they have it, that they have it naturally, right? Back to the story. You know, look, I've got five grandkids. My grandkids can take an empty toilet paper roll and turn it into a thousand different toys, right? We're naturally born with curiosity. We are naturally born with that imagination, that ingenuity, that creativity. We've lost it somewhere over the years of growing up. In some cases, we just need to refine it. We need to be shown that, hey, if Joe down the street can innovate, I can innovate too. And that's what we need. We need to unlock the broader population's recognition that they can innovate. And they can innovate right where you're at. You don't have to go to Silicon Valley. You, your, your dream should not be, you know, I get, I get a job in software engineering and the day after graduation, I take my graduation money, buy my plane ticket, go fly to San Francisco. Now, that may be a valid dream and a great dream for you. You know, quite honestly, it worked well for me. But I also don't want that to be the only approach to innovation and that there's a lot of different ways to innovate. You don't have to innovate only in Silicon Valley. There are a lot of other places that you can innovate. So hopefully I proved that out to you here a little bit. And particularly, there's the stories about the, the cab driver and the limo driver. That's what really was the inspiration for me to sit down and quickly record this show. Again, I apologize as I am sitting here in a clothes closet looking at my clothes and uh, recording this show. So I apologize for the audio quality, but I wanted to get this show out, get it recorded while it was fresh top of mind. That there are some great innovations occurring outside of Silicon Valley. With that, if you've got any comments, questions about the show, drop me a note, phil at killerinnovations.com. Also, hop on over to killerinnovations.com to the show notes. We have links and resources going back to 2005. Also, don't forget about the blog over at philmckinney.com. We po I post regularly over on the blog. Um, that tends to be um, things that we don't cover here in the show. Um, in many cases, longer formats, more examples of People who are doing innovation pretty well and companies, organizations will do a little case study on things that maybe they don't do so well. So check those out. Another great resource. Also, we are publishing the full excerpt of the, of the book, Beyond the Obvious, my book. And you can find that over at beyondtheobvious.com. And with that, we're going to wrap up this show. We thank you very much for the time that you take out of your schedule to listen to it. And we greatly appreciate the, uh, the feedback and the comments. If I do have one favor to ask, could you hop on over to iTunes and give us a rating? That helps uh, raise the visibility of the show, gets uh, more subscribers to follow, and hopefully we can have more impact on innovators or wannabe innovators that are out there who may think they've got that great idea but not the confidence to take it forward. So with that, have a great week. Do not let the innovation antibodies get you down. Keep on innovating and go out there and change the world.